Acknowledging the gift sets the stage for the second part, the response in gratitude. This response, I believe, consists in refashioning the gifts we receive, of impressing our own personality on them. For example, we receive language as a gift, but we use it in our own way. We receive love as a gift, but we express it in our own voice. The same process applies to every other gift that we receive. In impressing our personality on these gifts, we seek to make them better, to be closer to the ideal of the good. That is to say, there is some good that we are capable of expressing, that each of us are capable of re expressing, that no other human being in history is capable of doing. The good is infinite in its variety and complete only in the mind of God. We might make a weak comparison to a diamond with an infinite number of facets. The diamond itself represents the whole of the good, but each of us is like one of those infinite facets reflecting the light in our own particular color and direction. So then, there is something in each of us which only we can contribute to the common good. There is a gift in each of us that only we can give. And when we fail to pass on our gifts, to reflect the light that we have received, then the kingdom of God is delayed for another day. Now the third part consists in passing on the gift. Part of the task of passing on gifts occurs in marriage and the family, which was the subject of the last speaker. Here is our primary opportunity to return what we have received. First in giving being to children, and then to giving to spouse and children all the good things we have received. Hopefully in a better condition than, uh, than they were when we received them. It is easy to, enough to speak of the family as an economy of gifts. Well, you don't charge your children room and board, at least not below the age of six. Um, however, I am suggesting that even those things which are a part of the exchange economy, those things covered by a price, are also part of the gift economy. Considered properly, the gift, the price funds the gift but it does not explain it. And I will go even further to say that an economy in which products are not regarded as gifts will tend, as a merely technical matter, to exhibit certain pathologies. And among these are the, patho are the pathologies we call recessions and depressions, booms and busts. More of this in a moment, but for now I will merely assert that even the exchange economy, properly understood, is part of the gift economy. A gift, we should note, is always an expression of love to one degree or another. Hence, a gift economy presupposes a civilization of love. Uh, to use a term from, Saint, from um, John Paul's Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life. Again, this is the kind of term that an economist finds suspicious. However, allow me to point out that a civilization of love is the only kind of civilization that is possible. To be sure, a civilization without love will be uncivil, but it will also be unstable um, and impractical always on the brink of disaster and always requiring massive statist interventions to preserve it for another day until the day when the whole structure falls 
of its own loveless weight. I believe that is the situation in which we find ourselves today. Our task, then, is to save what can be saved and to rebuild on the basis of love the only sound basis for life. Now, this ev evangelization is the task of the laity, the third term that Father Sweeney dealt with. I have to start out by saying I'm not uh, sure that I care for the term laity. In the first place, it places the emphasis in the wrong place on what we are not. For the laity is simply regarded as those who are not ordained priests. But we are priests. By virtue of our baptism, we are priests, prophets, and kings. The proper division, in my opinion, is not between the priesthood and the laity, whoever they are, but between the sacramental priesthood and the popular priesthood, the priesthood of the people. The sacramental priesthood has the task of mediating the sacraments to God's people. But the popular priesthood has the task of mediating the graces we receive in the sacraments to the whole world. It is the popular priesthood that is the leaven of the world, the salt of the earth, and that has the task of making the gospel concrete and present in the world in a real and visible way. I want to speak then of this practical task of building up of this very practical civilization of love. However, before I do that, I want to pause to contrast this view with what might be called the public orthodoxy that guides our politics and economics. This public orthodoxy I call liberalism or individualism. The purpose of this liberalism is to bring a perfect liberty to individuals. Further, the individuals are conceived of as autonomous, self-seeking, rights-bearing entities. <coughs> as such, these individuals are not bound by any natural ties, because to do so would limit their freedom. Indeed, they have only such obligations as they agree to accept, and only for as long as they agree to accept them. Think of divorce. Thus, the rich network of relationships in which we find ourselves are replaced by thin contractual ties, ties that bind only for as long as the contract requires. And the only motive for action is pure self-interest. Any other motive can only be a matter of self-delusion or a moralistic cover for self-interested behavior. In this view, there can be no common good per se. Rather, the public good is obtained by summing up all the private goods. Uh, so that the political and economic order seek the greatest good for the greatest number. But this greatest good cannot refer to any objective reality, because there is no objective reality, nor indeed any objective truth. That there is only what each person thinks is good for himself. An attitude we frequently encounter when people say things like that, like, well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. 